Hello, uh, good morning. Um, if you have any trouble hearing me, please just uh, let me know and I will try and speak up or get further uh, to the microphone. Uh, I am very sorry for not joining you in person and for missing yesterday's talks. I did catch a bit of the last talk. Um, I'll give a bit of a personal introduction first. I'm currently working at the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk in Cambridge University. Um, but that's quite a new job and previously I spent several years with the Institute for Science Ethics at Manchester University um, where I've been working on international governance of biotechnologies and of genetic resources. Um, so what should be obvious from that is I'm going to talk about the international level of, of governance. Um, that's perspective I can bring, but I hope that what I'm saying has relevance for considerations at regional and national levels of regulation as well. So within the presentation, I'm aiming to place calls for new regulations to address genome editing technologies within the context of existing international governance of biotechnologies. Um, I want to identify the problems that existing governments can have in keeping pace with scientific and technological advances, but I also want to explain why developing new regulations shouldn't be seen as an unproblematic solution. Um, but then to go on to outline other ways of dealing with updating regulation. So in discussing international regulation, I think I probably mean something different to what some of the other speakers would have uh, brought up. What I concentrate on are rules that are agreed between states that are potentially universal in scope. So this means that they're not limited uh, by uh, geographic um, considerations, uh, any state can subscribe to these rules. Um, I include within what I consider both the hard and soft elements of international law. So these are both the legally binding treaties and conventions, but also uh, voluntary standards, guidelines and codes. And I include both because both do have influence on state behaviour. Um, and in fact, in some cases, uh, the voluntary instruments can have as much influence as a treaty can. Um, and when we're considering um, keeping pace with scientific and technological advances, those softer voluntary um, agreements can have some advantages in being uh, more readily updatable. Uh, so can I have the next slide, please? So this just gives some examples of the ways in which new advances in science and technology are frequently accompanied by the calls for new regulation. But those calls to often will overlook things like the relevance of a range of existing regulations the existence of mechanisms associated with those regulations for reviewing scientific and technological advances and that are designed to respond and track those advances, but also the hazards of developing new international rules. This is not to say that there's no need to examine the relevance and effectiveness. Okay, I'm being told the audio is not so good, so I'll try and speak up a bit. And and also a bit slower. Forward. Can you, That's fine. Can you, can you try to talk a little bit slower the, in order for us to understand better? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. So I'm not trying to argue that there's no need to examine the relevance and effectiveness of existing regulation for addressing scientific and technological advances, um, as in some of the examples on the slide. Nor that amendment or additions won't be necessary but that there are good reasons to be cautious about adopting new regulations. Um, I think this may have been something that's come up in your discussions already, but I would say that it's often unclear how new new technologies are and what the boundaries are of the new terminologies that apply to them. So this can be the case in genome editing technologies, as has been the case with synthetic biology. And this has arisen quite a lot in the international discussions of how to handle synthetic biology is what the boundaries of that term mean. So can I have the next slide, please? So don't worry if you can't see all the detail on this slide. Um, but the key point about the context of existing international regulation of biotechnologies, much of which applies to genome editing, is that this is already a hugely diverse and complex area. The diagram provides an illustration of this showing the range of regulation that needs to be taken into account simply for a decision on whether to export a genetically engineered bacterium. Uh, next slide, please. So a lot of the discussion around regulation of non-human genome editing is focused on whether it's adequately captured or covered by 
genetically modified organism focus regulation. Um, in the EU, those include directives on the contained use of genetically modified microorganisms, the deliberate release into the environment of genetically modified organisms, and regulations relating to genetically modified food and feed. The international rules that most closely relate to those directives are standards for laboratory biosafety that are issued by the World Health Organization, so they relate to contained use, the carter hain Protocol on Biosafety to the Convention on Biodiversity, which relates to deliberate release and transboundary movement of genetic materials. And what is known as the Codex Alimentarius Principles and Guidelines on Food Safety Assessment of Foods Produced Using or Derived from Recombinant DNA Organisms. However, there are a range of relevant rules beyond this. The range that apply in particular cases will vary depending on, for example, the type of organism and its intended use, but some of these regulations include those on the slide. I should uh, point out that I am focusing more on the non-human aspects of genome editing, um, simply because actually in terms of the very international universally applicable regulations, there is very little that formally addresses uh, the human aspects of genome editing. So some of the regulations include things like the Biological Weapons Convention. Oh, sorry, we don't need to go on yet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is both because it prohibits non-peaceful uses of biology, but it also um, advances and promotes peaceful activities, particularly medical research using biotechnologies. There are rules relating to human, animal and plant health. Uh, which, for example, constrain the movement of certain biological materials and organisms across borders, but they also promote good practice through the provision of standards, for example, on vaccine production and the use of antimicrobial agents to avoid antimicrobial resistance. These uh, rules, health rules, also have associated expert networks and monitoring surveillance and response mechanisms that will share and utilise genetic materials and associated data. There are a variety of trade rules through the World Trade Organization, particularly the technical barriers to trade agreement and the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement. There are rules relating to the protection of intellectual property rights, so the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights agreement of the World Trade Organization, also the Convention on the Protection of New Varieties of Plants, and various rules within the World Intellectual Property Organization as well. Some very significant rules at the moment are those for access and benefit sharing over genetic resources, and these relate particularly to the Nagoya Protocol on genetic resources, that's on their fair um, and equitable benefit sharing from access to genetic resources, and the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources. Those rules require prior informed consent of the provider state for access to any genetic material, and associated contractual arrangements for the sharing of any benefits from products or processes that utilise those materials. So this will apply to genome editing technologies. While I mentioned that there isn't much um, that formally deals with um, or addresses human genome editing at the international level, there are three declarations from the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organisation that cover the human genome and human rights international um, human genetic data, and bioethics and human rights. So these do provide some principles which may guide uh, national legislation, but they are not legally binding treaties. And it's, it's unclear how much states take note of those uh, declarations. Finally, there are provisions within many of the other rules that relate to development issues. So they relate to things like technology transfer, uh, provision of financial assistance um, and other capacity building mechanisms. Now, none of these rules will specifically mention genome editing, but that doesn't mean they don't apply to it. Um, and they, some of them will apply to the practice of genome editing, and others will apply to products and processes that are associated with it. Where definitions are provided in these rules of science, technology or biotechnology, these will often be broad enough to cover genetic genome editing. 
So, for example, the Convention on Biodiversity defines biotechnology as any technology application that uses biological systems, living organisms or derivatives thereof, to make or modify processes for specific use. However, having said that about the definitions of science, technology and biotechnology being quite broad, there is more of a problematic issue with how things like genetically modified or living modified organisms might be defined and whether they can cover genome editing techniques. It's also worth noting that these regulations largely developed in separation from each other um, at different times and in very different technological contexts. So they've developed from the 1970s through to uh, the most recent one being in 2010. Uh, unsurprisingly, they don't form a coherent whole and they have potential points of tension and contradiction, which brings us back to why complexity can be particularly problematic. So can I have the next slide, please? So I said I'd mention a bit about why there are problems in maintaining relevance to scientific and technological advances. But say one of the one of the points is that these regulations developed in very different technological contexts. Um, in some cases, they have inbuilt general review processes for the conventions and treaties. Um, that have the potential to take scientific and technological advances into account. And in some cases, they have specific science and technology review or advisory processes that are designed to identify advances that have particular relevance to their implementation. But actual advancement or amendment of regulations is very slow, particularly for the legally binding treaties. Voluntary standards and guidance can be quicker to update, so a good example here is the World Animal Health Organization's Terrestrial and Aquatic Animal Health Codes. Um, they are regularly re reviewed on an annual basis um, and are therefore frequently updated on an annual basis as well. So they're much better at keeping pace with emerging issues. Um, for example, last year they added several chapters dealing with antimicrobial resistance issues. And they have previously added chapters to do with recombinant DNA technology. Um, also, with some of the legally binding treaties, there are incorporate standard setting processes. So a good example of that is the International Plant Protection Convention, which has a standard setting process that operates alongside it. And because that's an ongoing process, it can also be quicker to respond to advances in science and technology. I also note that in some cases, there is no uh, process associated with a regulation for reviewing science and technology advances or the process may be inadequate in scope or in resourcing, which is often a problem. Also, some of the scientific advisory processes are actually dominated by um, policy or political representation rather than expert representation, which can cause problems and give limited space to, to incorporating scientific expertise. Um, connected to that, there's generally a lack of awareness among and engagement of the scientific affected scientific communities during both the development and the implementation of these international rules. This can result in significant unintended consequences of those rules, or it can in fact result in them working against their principles. So currently there are significant concerns about how some countries might implement the Nagoya Protocol and access and benefit sharing to genetic resources, potentially extending it to cover digital genetic information something which is considered likely to be unworkable and hugely disruptive to many fields of the life sciences. And again, the, the scientific community was not fully engaged in the process of negotiating that treaty, nor in devising implementation processes. Specifically in relation to advances in genome editing and related technologies, issues of engagement with scientific and technology communities um, seem to be particularly problematic when it comes to risk assessment processes. So it's clear that adjustments to current risk assessment approaches in the international rules will be necessary, and those will need to be based on scientific evidence on how they should adjust and what's most appropriate and effective for capturing the new risks of these technologies. Those adjustments will not only need to take into account novel organisms, but it's looking increasingly important for them to develop ways of extending beyond the risk assessment of biological materials to associated data. So next slide, please. 
So what are some of the problems with creating new regulations? So as I raised earlier, there's an issue already of the degree of complexity in this area. This um, has various negative impacts on how states navigate the system. So there's a difficulty for states in being aware of the full range of rules that will apply to particular activities. They will be uncertain about which rules other countries are applying and how they are prioritising them. In some cases, there is significant scope for divergent national interpretation of international rules. And that means that there's a further need to be identifying um, all the different national implementing legislation and understanding that as well as the international. So that could be that you need to understand 150 countries' different national legislation. It's also difficult to understand how areas of overlap and duplication and areas of tension and contradiction that emerge from this complexity are going to be handled. So basically what I'm saying there is this is already a difficult regulatory space to navigate. Adding additional regulation to it is likely to, to compound those problems. The burden of regulatory proliferation is connected to these issues of complexity. But even if you had a clear set of regulations, a coherent set of regulations in place, there would be significant drawbacks to adding additional regulation. So these include that the organisations and processes associated with the regulations are generally inadequately financed already, and such resources would then have to stretch even further. There would be significant opportunity costs to adding new regulation. There are costs to individual countries associated with each regulation, and many countries lack um, capacity to participate in the negotiation and review processes and to effectively implement the regulations. This, again, will create uncertainty. Um, how should an individual act where there is no implementing, uh, national implementing legislation or no national contact point in place for a particular rule? Um, and also it creates inequities because, while I said many countries lack capacity to, to be um, participating in these processes, other countries do have capacity to do so. And it creates inequities in uh, power relations of who gets to have influence within these processes. So uh, I think that it's fairly obvious that international negotiations are still substantially influenced by power relations and dynamics, and what gets excluded or included in a particular rule developed in, during negotiation is often the result of bargaining processes rather than an assessment on the merit of a particular point being included or not. So you would want, perhaps, for all rules to be based on good understanding of what's reasonable and what's evidence-based, but they will often be uh, based instead on bargaining in perhaps entirely different issues in different forums influencing the particular uh, regulation. So basically that means that it's very difficult to predict the outcome if you start negotiating an international rule. Um, in the case of legally binding treaties in particular, the negotiation of an original document, um, as well as any amendments to those documents, can be a very lengthy process. And it's not unusual to have a 10 to 15 year timescale for that process. So if a legally binding regulation specific to genome editing were to be adopted, this means that, on the one hand, there may well be a lengthy gap where there is an absence of regulation and that further advances are likely to have taken place before the regulation is finally adopted, which means maybe it's already out of date. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention here was um, problems to do with definitional boundaries. So I mentioned before that there's a great deal of debate about how synthetic biology should be defined um, when interpreting international rules. The problem um, relates to creating any new regulation that's specific to a technology area. Those rules are likely to require some definition of what the field means. So in this case, you may need to define what genome editing technologies mean. That has risk where either it's set too broadly, um, because activities it wasn't intended to affect will be affected and covered, or when it's defined too narrowly and specifically, because that risks excluding certain activities and creating ways around the regulation um, that could be exploited. In this regard, a more appropriate option seems to be to have a broader sense of scientific and technological developments that may be relevant, and accompany that by good quality scientific review processes. Okay, so next slide, please. 
I just want to outline a few ways we may get around these problems and not have to be adding new regulations. So um, I think some of these should be fairly obvious, um, but one way is through providing additional guidance, um, even or especially in cases where it's decided that ultimately there needs to be a new regulation. Um, during the interim period, guidance should be provided. This would ideally be done at the international level by an associated international organisation, but it doesn't have to be done at that level. So this could be done by the EU issuing guidance as well. So that sort of guidance would, for example, explain how an existing rule should be interpreted and or applied to particular advances. The World Health Organization, for example, added a chapter to its third edition of its laboratory biosafety manual relating to recombinant DNA technology, and it could do the same thing for genome editing. Um, additional guidance can also be produced through um, using decision-making processes that are associated with the review of treaties. So, for example, through regular meetings of their state's parties. These can make recommendations about how to interpret provisions in light of new advances, which don't substantively alter the treaty text, but they can be very useful. So, for example, states' parties to the Biological Weapons Convention regularly use its review conferences to reaffirm that it's comprehensive in scope, that it covers all naturally and artificially created or altered microbial or other biological agents, as well as their components, and it applies to all scientific and technological developments in the life sciences and other fields of science relevant to the Convention. Um, the weaknesses I pointed to in science and technology review processes can be addressed, uh, for example, through more sustainable financing through those systems, and for establishing particular requirements for the inclusion of scientific expertise that can connect to other efforts that can be made to increase engagement with science and technology communities for example, through involvement of national academies and professional societies. So another example in the context of the Biological Weapons Convention is that the Inter-Academies Panel, which is a, um, an international association of science academies, um, produces a, a report for the review conferences on relevant scientific and technological advances. Coordination between international organisations on cross-cutting areas can also help mitigate some of the burdens of regulatory proliferation and can address some of the areas of overlap and potential tension, so give guidance to states on what they should be prioritising and what the underlying principles are. Another way of addressing complexity problems is through mapping of applicable regulations and raising awareness of the full range and interconnections between them for both those affected by those regulations and those responsible for their implementation. But there's also a more general need for substantially expanded capacity building activities to support the implementation of international rules and to increase developing country representation in negotiation processes and their participation in the science and technology review activities. There are commitments made within many of the international rules to do just this sort of activity, um, but they're not fulfilled adequately at the moment. So I'm just going to summarise quickly. The key points I'm hoping that I got across are that while adjustment or amendment of existing regulations and provision of additional guidance may be necessary in response to advances in genome editing technologies, there are various reasons to make the creation of new international regulations a last resort. It may ultimately be that some new rules are necessary. However, a lot can be achieved through adapting, amending or adding to existing rules that need not involve uh, lengthy negotiation processes to revise treaties and can be done through the provision of guidance on implementation or decisions or recommendations issued by the governing bodies of those uh, treaties. Thank you.